world in new ways. And those are the slides there. And uh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Come on. <laughs> That should fix it. Ooh. This, this is one of the dangers of doing live technology in front of an audience. I'm sure you've experienced this before. Come on, you silly thing. Why are you going so slow? There we go. And assuming that that's just doing what it should be doing. Oh, this is sad. The live broadcast might not work. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's all over here now. All right. All right. Um, I'll... No, it should be the other way because now you're showing me the comments and not my slides. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So. Some preliminaries, and I can't read that. <laughs> All right. This is an interactive session, can you tell? <laughs> um, yeah, as for some, I just I updated my broadcasting software last night, and it runs a bit slowly on this machine, which disappoints me greatly because this is a pretty powerful machine. But, oh well. Um, so, there's a back channel. And what that means is you are participating in this session with me. Um, you can either go to that URL and then select the channel 10NAC or you can use Twitter or Mastodon, uh, and if you do, use the hashtag 10NAC in your comment. What will happen is your comments will be displayed in the order they are received. They will show up on that screen. And uh, be polite, <laughs> because your, your comments are being broadcast to the entire room. Uh, they're also being broadcast on the internet, hopefully in my live stream, which may or may not be working. Who knows? Um, which makes me realize, make a backup recording. <laughs> uh, voice recorder. Okay, this is the backup recording. For continuing professional development, um, October 2, 2018. Okay, this isn't as rough a start as I've had in the past. So, um, so the idea of the back channel, because a lot of these talks, someone gets up at the podium here and then tells you about a bunch of stuff, and you write it down and remember it and go back home and then forget it. Um, you'll probably forget most of what I say today. That's the way the brain works. I can live with that. Um, so what I'm after is maybe changing your perspective, changing your point of view, raising some questions, pushing you to think about the world in slightly different ways. Part of the way of doing that is getting you involved in this. I'll be throwing out some topics for discussion. With luck, you'll be discussing them in the back chat back channel. And I can see you've, you've picked it up already. Excellent. So that's one preliminary. Second preliminary, hopefully this is being webcast. 
What that means is what's happening in this room does not stay in this room. Um, hopefully there's a permanent live record of this going out online now. So don't say anything you'll regret. Um, <laughs> Um, because when you're running for office or judge 35 years from now, <laughs> um, I have a camera here. I might pan in the audience. If you don't want to be in the audience, maybe be to that side. Uh, if you don't want to be on the screen. Um, so anyhow, that's the webcast. Okay, I've done the back. Oh. Okay, I've done the back channel, done the webcast. Have I missed a slide? No? Oh, I see what I've done. I've titled that incorrectly. All right, this is the disclaimer. And 99% of the talks that I give and that's not an exaggeration. That's actually a bit of an underestimate. There's no such thing as these disclaimers. In education, technology and education policy, etc. discussions, they don't reveal these things. So this is one of the good things that you guys have going that I think should be transferred over to education because there's an awful lot of shilling in education conferences. Uh, I'm not one of those shills. Um, I'd like to be, then I'd have money. Um, no, I'm just kidding. So anyhow, relations with commercial interests, I have none. Uh, where I get my money, I work for the National Research Council of Canada. It's a federal government research agency. I don't get paid a whole lot of money, but I'm very proud to be a member of Canada's public service. Uh, I'm doing what I want to be doing. I get a little bit of extra money from consulting from agencies and NGOs, no companies though. Uh, I do take donations on my website, there's a full list of all donors on my website, and I get expenses for talks, once in a while I get paid, I'm not being paid for this talk. So the objectives for today. Uh, assess learning technologies from the perspective of affordances, describe core elements of a personal learning environment, identify emerging trends in continuing professional development. Maybe you'll get these objectives, maybe not. I'm not really an objectives person. I'm an affordances person. I want you to be capable of more than you were before in some undesignated, undefined way. Um, it'll be different for each one of you. Uh, you'll see the world slightly differently maybe, you'll ask different questions. Each of your perspectives is different. I don't want you all to learn the same thing from this presentation. I want you to learn, what is this, about a hundred, a hundred different perspectives. So here are the contents. I'm going to talk a bit about affordances and a specific way of looking at some affordances. I'm going to talk about personal learning. Then the really interactive bit comes in when we talk about the old problems and the new ways, and then I'll have a few concluding remarks on evidence. How does that sound for everyone? Okay. I'm, I'm waiting for people to say no, and then I say, okay. <laughs> I will now talk about ancient Greece. <laughs> Okay, affordances, also known as looking for parking. <laughs> uh, so on Saturday, well, that's two days or three days ago now, Tim Berners-Lee announced he was launching a startup, it's called Inrupt, um, to develop and distribute something that he's been working on for two, three, four years called SOLID. SOLID stands for Social Linked Data. And what he's up to here is important. It's important in the sense that he's trying to push the web towards its original vision of being a distributed, decentralized network of interacting servers rather than a publishing platform dominated by a few major players like Facebook, Google, Twitter, etc. 
This has been not just the ambition of the web for many years, it's also been one of the major design philosophies and it's been one of the major trends shaping technology over, well, gee, the last 20 years. Now, we, we began the web with static web pages and then in the early 2000s we had this revolution called Web 2.0, which was all about social media and programming interfaces and sharing data with each other, but it was all about social media and sharing data with each other. Um, it had its weaknesses and it was taken over by, as I say, these large platforms. But the push has been consistently through Web 1, Web 2 for this decentralized network. But what does that mean? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to an old canard, uh, the state versus the individual. And we could represent that in two different ways. There's the state centralized. It's like the old fashioned broadcasting networks, right? <coughs> Uh, our, our, our KO in the middle broadcasting its, its thing out of the newspapers or the government or you know, the president of whatever versus the individual, the Anran, rugged individualist, John Wayne, cowboys, horses, etc. And over time the state evolved, became more decentralized, but that picture there is of a hierarchy. There's still someone at the center, but now we have departments, divisions, etc. It's an improved form of organization. And it resembles to a large degree the internet of today, where we have a hierarchy. Google in the center, because Google, um, and then the major platforms, LinkedIn, Yahoo, etc. And then on the other side, there's always, of course, the individual. But in the middle, and I you notice I position this very deliberately, in the middle between the centralized network and this atomistic view of the world of separate individuals is the network. Now, honestly, for the rest of this discussion, I'm not going to worry about that picture of individuals at all because if we can't connect at all, there's no internet. So, and it's a silly view. So, really, we have two major classifications. The old, the new, groups, networks, hierarchies, grids. See the picture there? Now, you've probably heard that before, but these come with different affordances, different perspectives, different points of view, different ways of seeing the world. And how these break out is important for an understanding of technology. So, I've broken them out. So on the one hand, we have groups characterized by one way. On the other hand, we have networks characterized by many ways. Don't worry about wherever they are. They're over there now. Uh, don't worry about copying down these slides. They're all available on the presentation website and you'll get them later. So probably the biggest difference between groups and networks is groups are defined by unity, networks are defined by diversity. In a group, you're all marching to the same drummer, playing off the same playbook, following the same vision statement, etc. But in a network, each individual is participating and seeing the network in their own individual way. Now, we've already had some discussion of diversity here and you're beginning to see this wave of diversity come through your workplace. This isn't just a moral and ethical play. This is a change, a fundamental change in how we see the world and how we see the world is changing from everybody must resemble everybody else to everybody is different and that's actually a better way to organize things. The reason you want diversity is because it works better in networks. And conversely, networks work better with diversity. Think of a phone network. Imagine everybody on your phone network was saying the same thing. Would anyone make a phone call? Of course not. 
Why would you? They're saying the same thing you are. The reason you phone somebody else is because they will say something different from you. And that's what makes a phone network valuable. It's a pretty basic concept, yet in groups, it doesn't work that way. In groups, the focus is on coordination, management, structure, um, leadership. In networks, the focus is on autonomy. Each individual is out there on their own, but not completely on their own. They're making connections, they're interacting, they're communicating with other people, So, but they're not being told what to do. And again, if you think about it, if everybody's coordinated, then you have no diversity. Conversely, if you have diversity, you don't need and don't want coordination. <coughs> Groups tend to be closed. You're in a group or you're out of group. You're part of the skull and bone society or you're not. Networks are open. Anyone can join. Anyone can leave. I've often told people, the great thing about my talks, you can leave. Sometimes they do. <laughs> Networks are defined, and not just openness and membership and that, but also openness and content, openness and resources. Closed publishing is a group model. Open publishing, open resources, like the Massive Open Online Course, is a network model. And then finally, groups are distributive. It's an awkward word, and I don't really like it, and I can't think of a better one. But what I mean by that is, the knowledge in a group comes from the center and then is distributed out to everybody in the audience. Makes sense, right? Kind of like this room, right? Um, by contrast, the knowledge in a network is created through interactivity, which is what I'm trying to do with the, um, the back channel. It's kind of quiet at the moment, but um, it's kind of hard to talk and watch, but that's okay. It's, it's a challenge, it's fun. Um, and what's interesting is, to me anyways, when knowledge is distributive, then the knowledge that can be learned is no more than the knowledge that can be had by one person. Because you're getting it from one person and that everybody creates little clones of that knowledge in their own brains. The knowledge that's created by interactivity, however, in a network is what they call emergent. It's knowledge that is created by and a property of the network as a whole and no individual in that network. That sounds like an awkward concept. You guys deal with it all the time. I usually use an example of flying an airplane, but I'll use an example of uh, curing a person of cancer. I'm making this up, so forgive me all my errors. No one person knows how to cure somebody of cancer. Uh, say, uh, I don't know, lymphoma, whatever. Again, I'm making this up because I know nothing about medicine. But you need, well, you, when you think about what you need, you need the doctor, you need the nurses, you need the person at the reception desk, otherwise people would never get signed in. You need the people who cook all the meals. You need the people who sweep the floors. You need the person who did the research to find the cure that's being used by the doctor to cure the cancer. You need the funders for that person in the research, etc. right? The, act, the simple thing, all right, and even an aspirin, right? No one person knows how to make one of those. Each person knows a part of it, and the knowledge of how to do it is something that the network as a whole has. If everybody knew the same thing in that network, then it would not be possible to accomplish that because no individual human can know enough to be able to do those things. Did that make sense? It's the first time I've tried it with a medical example. <laughs> for, as you can see, for good reason. So, this is what I'm casting here as affordances. And 
you know, and you can kind of tell I lean to the network view. I, I often preface my talks by saying, you don't have to believe anything I say. And that's really important. Um, and in fact, I expect there were, will be people, like the person who doesn't believe a word I'm saying. That's fine. Uh, if you like groups, you like groups. If you like networks, you like networks. If you think it should be characterized differently, it can be characterized differently. That's okay. What I'm trying to get you to think of is, think of these dimensions of technology. Think of these dimensions of learning technology. Think about what you can do with a group kind of model, what you can do with a network kind of model. And then think about what your objectives are in, say, continuing professional development. Does a group model or a network model better fit the kind of thing that you're trying to do? If you want everybody to get a certificate with exactly the same piece of knowledge, probably going to go a group way, right? But if you want people to be able to learn on the fly by communication with the team around them, their colleagues across the country and around the world, you're going to have to use a network approach. So it really depends on what you're up to here, what you want your technology to do, what you want your learning design to do. So as was mentioned in the introduction, we created the massive open online course. We built the first one back in 2008. It was called Connectivism and Connective Knowledge. It was a pretty niche topic. And we expected maybe a dozen people or so, maybe 20. And we got 2,200 people in our online course, um, which was a bit of a surprise to us. And nonetheless, the course was a success. We weren't completely overwhelmed. We were able to teach large numbers of people in a successful way because we had designed the course as a network. And one thing that we've learned over the years, networks scale in ways that groups don't. And you feel this directly if you're doing uh, learning, professional development, etc. How many people can you fit in this room? Could we get 2,200 people in here? Maybe. <laughs> it wouldn't be very comfortable. Even the simple thing of broadcasting, if it works, on YouTube, means that we've expanded our audience by ones and twos. Okay. Uh, but we could have expanded it into like dozens, maybe hundreds, over time. And I'm unable to track these videos. Over time, not long from now, there will be more people watching this online than are in this room. Uh, over the course of a year, two years, there will be thousands of people watch this talk. The simple act of networking allows it to scale. And we've networked in other ways. Using the hashtag on Twitter means that people out there can participate. I haven't seen any comments come in from the external world, but they could. They could be watching this video, make a comment using Twitter, and you'd see it here. And we're now part of that wider network. And we can have a course of 2,200 people. And that should change your thinking about what can be done with continuing professional development. <clears throat> and you've started using MOOCs. Well, you've started using those MOOCs. Um, one of the uh, award winners yesterday, uh, Emergency Medicine Review, used Udemy. Udemy is a MOOC software. I consider it very primitive MOOC software, but it does capture some of the affordances, right? Uh, it does use video in order to be able to reach wider audiences. It does generate some kinds of interaction, etc. And there have been a few other MOOCs, edX, Udacity, Coursera, uh, uh, Future Learn from uh, the Open University in the UK, even EduRock out of Jordan, um, which is a great name for a MOOC company. So they're beginning to proliferate. They're still in their beginning stages, but, they're but they are an example of a shift in learning generally from this group's model to this network's model. And that takes us to personal learning. 
So I, I do lots of dichotomies. I probably shouldn't. Anytime I do one of this, there are two ways of thinking of things. Know that in my mind, there's like 1,800 ways of looking at things, and I've narrowed them down to two arbitrarily. You can narrow them down in different ways. But I think this one works, and it kind of makes a point. Because the kind of learning that we're after in networks and the kind of learning that we're after in MOOCs can be characterized as personal learning. And personal learning can be characterized by contrast with traditional learning. In traditional learning, you begin with a body of content, learning objectives. I told you, I'm not an objectives guy. And you want that to result in successful practice. Sounds familiar? In personal learning, you begin with somebody who's actually doing something already. Maybe they're trying to make a sterling engine. Maybe they're working in an ER place. Uh, I told you, I know nothing about medicine. Um, they're doing their thing, and they need to do it better. But as they do their thing, what happens is they're generating content. And when you think about it, that's kind of where our knowledge comes from in the first place, isn't it? You try something, you see if it works. Oh, hey, it works. Now I know something new. So two different kinds of approaches. So, if you think about it, the approach that starts with content defines some ideal state that you want everyone to attain. It's got to be a pretty basic ideal state because you want everyone to attain it. But on the other hand, and it's going to be a pretty general ideal state, isn't it? Because it applies to everyone, so don't be too specific here. On the other hand, when you start with practice, you begin with a desired state. If you're doing something, you want to be able to complete what you're doing, whatever it is. Um, run your engine, fly a plane, cure a patient, uh, whatever. Um, learn ancient Greek, just because. Um, in the traditional approach, you have this content, you try to memorize this content, and, and then someone tests you and finds you wanting. On the other hand, when you try to do something, you get a result and then the person at the other end looks at the result with you and tries to help you. See the difference in attitude even? And so we go through a loop. In the content-based loop, you are tested, you are corrected, you must go back and try to learn the content again. And that, in fact, is the logical model for pretty much every learning management system out there. Do something, get tested, <coughs> just loop. <coughs> Meanwhile, the practice model, you begin with practice, you get your result, the person helps you, and then you iterate. On the content-based approach, <coughs> each loop is considered to be addressing a gap. On the practice-based approach, each loop is considered an opportunity. Different perspectives, different ways of looking at this. If you were a student, just think about it, which would you prefer? The traditional way is thought of as, you, you can think of it as like the library model, you have this row of dusty books you must learn. The other model is an environment model. It's a place where you're working, you're practicing, you're trying things out, you have a team, they're helping you, and you're iterating until you get to the result that you want. The one on the left, the content-based approach, is what is being sold everywhere as personalized learning. And it's personalized learning precisely because each person does this against this ideal concept 
sorry, ideal content. But they identify your personal gaps and then tailor the learning content that they will deliver to you and you will remember, and that's each loop. Personal learning is learning that you do for yourself. Now, you're not all alone. Never, never talk about, remember, we rejected atomism because it's foolish and, and futile. So you're in a network, you have a network of support, you have people helping you, you have resources, because you're not trying to do these things from nothing. Um, but you are defining the learning for yourself. Now, that's a hard model, especially for this crowd to adopt. And it's a hard model because your model of professional development is based on accreditation, certification, content, content objectives. And the question I put to you is, is this the right model? If you were doctors, say, I'd say, is this the right treatment? For the educational problem that you're trying to solve. And anticipating a few slides later, what would the evidence for that be? So, on my side, I've been looking at models of self directed learning, but so have you. So, yay! Here's one CPD e coach. And this is a model, this is very similar to a model, I unfortunately can't read my own slide here, but this is a person defining their own learning outcomes. Oh, <laughs> aren't we fun? I wonder why it died. Oh, no. As with any technology, if it doesn't work, reload it. <laughs> if it still doesn't work, shut down the machine and then restart the machine. Okay. Wow, that's slow too. Okay, well, we'll let that go and do what it's doing. Fortunately, this is a distributed system, right? You don't have to depend on the thing on the screen. Um, if you're following along in Twitter, you can follow along in Twitter. If you went to C-Chat, uh, that link that I gave you at the start, um, then you could be watching this. Ah, here we go. Are MOOCs still part of the hype cycle? No, they are not. Well, I mean, everything's part of the hype cycle because that's how Gartner defined it until they died. Uh, actually, last year, there were more MOOCs and more people registered in MOOCs than in any previous year. The year before, that'd be 2016, there were more MOOCs and more people registered in MOOCs than in all previous years combined. So. They're not dying, they're not hyped out or anything like that. Um, let's close that. And those figures are according to classcentral.com, uh, which does a comprehensive survey of MOOCs. See, there is evidence. Oh, it's dying again. Why? Why? <laughs> How weird. Very little magic. Hmm. Well, I don't know why it's dying. But there's still the Twitter channel. And like I say, it might be working on your on your sites. And now it's just dead. Anyhow, continuing. This is a really bad time for that to happen because we're moving into the uh, in more interactive part of this. I think what's happening now is that 
the traffic on the website has overloaded the website because I moved from my previous expensive web host to a new cheap web host because as I mentioned earlier, I don't have much money. <laughs> and now, now the entire Perl library seems to be collapsing. So anyhow, let me tell you about personal learning a little bit. So you begin with what you're doing. I've put look for a job contract project because that's where most people who are looking at learning are, are in the position of doing. But it could be working in your laboratory or, uh, or your clinic or your workplace or whatever, right? Basically what's happening here is you're trying to get something done. Get a job, solve your problem, whatever. Um, you can, if you want, register for a course. You could also find learning resources, uh, watch a video, take part in an online seminar, uh, which hopefully is not breaking, um, etc. Um, and then you enter into what can be styled as a personal learning workflow. This workflow, and I probably should have put big words up here to, to indicate the four major stages, aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. And you might think that that sounds very mechanical, but it isn't that mechanical. Um, because it, it's you working with the environment around you. The first step is aggregate, which basically means um, collect information. Experience things, find things, see what other people are sharing, etc. In the workflow here, I've got all the different sources in the online world that we use, email, um, RSS feeds, SharePoint, Facebook, government sources, repositories, learning management systems, whatever. All of that information is gathered. And then your task as a learner is to do something with this information in order to accomplish whatever it is that you're trying to do. And the, the two major things that happen here is remixing and repurposing. Remixing is typically taking information from different sources and combining them. There's many different ways of doing that, but the main idea is you're getting diverse perspectives, di uh, different points of view, information about different technologies, information using different technologies, etc. You bring that together. You put it into the same place or you know, adjacent to itself in the environment. That's yeah, kind of like, you know, if you're uh, making a, a clay model, you get some clay, you get some water, you get a wheel, you get power for your wheel, you get a ghost, and then you start spinning the clay around, you mold your clay, right? And that's the second part, is repurposing, right? You've gathered your stuff, now you're going to mold it and shape it and do whatever it is the hands-on thing that you want to do. I thought that the hands-on thing would be typing into our back channel, um, which might still work, but who knows. Um, and then key and critically important is you don't stop there. Then you, as they say, feed it forward. You share. And, and I generally mean that quite literally. There's a certain perspective that means sell, but generally it means share. It means pass along whatever it is that you've created back into the network. And the reason for that is um, you're, you're probably creating for that purpose in the first place, or alternatively, um, it's a way of motivating yourself or alternatively it's a way of giving back into that community that helped you learn this thing in the first place. Ah, it's working again. I, I think it was what they call a server panic. <laughs> That's a technical term. A server panic is what happens when the server for no apparent reason dies. So in personal learning, you're working with different kinds of data, many kinds of data. Typically, each individual have their own sources. 
their own kinds of data, their, their own, uh, how, how can I say sources and kinds in a different way, never mind. You get the idea. Uh, you might use journals, you might use lab instrument readings, you might use uh, feedback in person from other people from a technological perspective. It could be data in the form of pages, of pictures, multimedia, etc. There isn't actually a limit. And then the result of this is you do this and you share your results with the world and that over time helps you build your own personal learning record. And this is an attractive feature of personal learning because in the process of learning, you're doing two things. First of all, you're creating learning resources for other people, but also you're creating this record of your own learning activities. This record can be created and stored in different ways. Currently in the learning management system field, there's a standard called XAPI. And if you've seen that, or if you see that in the future, all that is is a mechanism of recording your learning activities for the purposes of future assessment. And the idea here is it doesn't matter where you've done that learning activity, whether it's on this website or Coursera or Udemy or whatever, you generate this activity record, that becomes part of your overall personal learning record. And we've died again. Line 46. Why are you? Yeah. And we're back. It's almost like they chose now to upgrade the web server. Um, so here, here's a simple model of how a personal learning record is created. Stuff goes in, stuff goes out. You have your personal library, you have your learning activities where you read stuff, watch stuff, play with stuff, make stuff, and then all of that is captured in learning analytics which records all of these activities. If this system were working perfectly and if it were connected to a wider learning system, then when you made a comment here, it would be recorded in my system. My system would record with your cooperation, your activity. That would go into your activity record. Then this organization would access your activity record automatically, of course, see that you took part in that activity and automatically issue a badge for having been in the room. And the only thing that would have had to happen for that to all have happened is for you to make a comment into um, this back channel. Now, of course, we can see on the screen the weakness of this approach. And there have to be multiple channels, multiple ways of being able to do this because if you depend on a single channel and it fails, um, then you don't get your credit. So this kind of data is called a personal graph. It's a new kind of data. Uh, each person will have their own personal graph. This is coming. Uh, it's going to be a while, yeah, 10 years, 20 years, but it is coming. Um, people will have their own personal learning record and it will be as unique to them as one of these. This is my personal economic record. It's, it's not very full, um, but it also has my personal driver's record, which is connected to my happily empty personal criminal record, um, <laughs> which is connected to my about to expire uh, Air Canada record, etc. Think of the characteristics of this personal record though. Okay. It's mine. I have it. You can't take this from me. Not without force. right? And, and I don't want you to take this from me. I, I protect it. It's mine. I'll share it with you. I might exchange bits of it for uh, goods and services. Right? right now I use paper money. In the future I'll probably use digital money. 
Um, same thing. Actually, my paper money has become digital money anyways now. It's, I hardly use paper money. Um, I actually pay for things with my phone now, which is kind of cool. Uh, except you don't see the money go or, yeah, yeah, coffee. You know. <laughs> um, these records are stored not just here, but all over the place, right? The uh, police department has criminal records. The driver's department has driver's records. I don't know what these are all called. The banks have economic records. The credit bureau assesses my credit cards, etc. There's a healthcare card in here. That's another agency, right? I have all of this data. This data is mine. This is me. I share it as needed, but that's my personal learning record. If I want to accomplish something, I pull out my record, I use the resources in my record in order to get something done. This isn't a test, it isn't an assessment, it's a way of getting things done. And that's how you should view your personal learning record. And those of you who might be in the healthcare industry, are probably thinking at this point, health care record as well, or electronic health record, or whatever they're called these days. And that kind of model is at play in the background there as well. Now think about the two models I've given you when you're thinking about health care records. Do you want one single centralized service which does this? Or do you want a distributed network where people own their own personal health care records? Same with learning records. I wonder if this will work now. <laughs> One of the attributes of working with technology, stubbornness. You have to be stubborn. Really, really stubborn. All right. Okay. So I wanted my original plan, my tentative plan at the moment until this dies again, is to look at some of the old problems from these new perspectives that I've outlined. So what are the old problems? One of them is managing conflicts of interest, which we just did the screen at the start, right? Well, if we have our distributed records, if we have what they call a distributed ledger system, or distributed ledger technology, or as they're calling it misleadingly in the news today, blockchain, then you have a mechanism for managing conflicts of interest. In the lower right-hand side of that slide, and you can't really read it, but what that is, and that's a thing that really exists, is a record of all of the grants that the National Research Council um, Industrial Research Assistant Program, IRAP, has distributed to companies across the country. And you can see, and you can search, etc., through all of those records. So any company that got money from us, they're in there. Any money that we gave to some company, it's in there. And what's interesting about this is, yes, this is on a database sitting in our offices, but it's also being published as part of a blockchain network, uh, to be precise, something called Hyperledger Fabric, which is not Bitcoin, it's not even close to Bitcoin. But it has the same kind of distributed technologies, which means two things. First of all, when we publish it, we can't change it. It's locked into place by crypto crypt crypt cryptographic technology. And there's a, a whole bunch of messy technology that makes that work. I, that's a whole separate talk. The other thing, and to my mind, the more important thing is, this record is distributed across any number of individual nodes. That means it's not just us that has this record. It's potentially you and you and you and you. It's potentially all of the companies here. It's potentially our friends in Russia and China, whoever. Everyone can have a node. And what that means is, even if we could change the data, everybody else would know right away that we changed the data. So it's a permanent record. Um, this kind of distributed record can go a long way toward 
recording transactions and interactions with commercial partners. So you're not depending on some guy at the front of the room saying, I've never had any dealings with that company, right? I even have a slide that says that. Um, instead, you can look up that person, it's probably a link in the program, and it'll show the blockchain record of all their projects, all their interactions, all their grants. And it'll be no harder to do this than the paperwork we currently do. So that's a possibility. See, what I was originally going to do, and I don't dare to do it now, is ask how you would address conflict of interest. Get a bunch of responses up here, and then you'd read the responses, think about them. I still want you to do that, but it might break. Do you want to try something else like the Mentimeter? We could put it up and people could still put in their questions and comments. Uh, not right now, because I've got, thank you, but I've got like 12 minutes left. and. Changing technology halfway through is going to take 12 minutes, <laughs> but I really appreciate that. Funding of continuing professional development. Um, see, this is a good one, and the slide doesn't even give away how we would do it. But think about how a distributed network of practitioners who are creating and sharing content might contribute toward addressing some of the costs of continuing professional development. There's a whole domain of discourse, which you've probably seen, called communities practice. Etienne Wenger is, is the guru behind that idea, but there's a bunch of people in this country as well working on it, people at Athabasca University. And the idea here is that people in the course of their day-to-day -day learning encounter problems, interact with other people about, around those problems, and share the solutions. On the internet, in a domain I do know about, which is programming, although the evidence is sometimes not there, uh, there's a, a website called Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is legend among computer programmers. It could be any website, it could be Reddit, uh, could be some Google group, I know there's a bunch, but Stack Overflow has become legend. And basically, people ask questions, people answer questions about programming. If you run into a programming problem and you do a search on Google, you'll probably find the answer in Stack Overflow. That's continuing professional development, really good CPD that helps me get my job done and it costs, well, internet connection. Access to CPD. Now there was the, uh, the course yesterday uh, was offered through Udemy and I praised it a few minutes ago. Now I'm gonna go the other way. Because I, I went to the website and looked it up and those numbers are too small, but it's hundreds in some cases, thousands of dollars for these courses. And this is one of the things that I've spent a career trying to fix. Because why does a course cost thousands of dollars? Um, I don't even want to ask what you guys paid or, or had your hospitals or divisions or whatever pay. I don't want to know. Please don't tell me it'll hurt. But why does it cost that much? Um, you know, contrast that with the distributed network that we created with the MOOC, um, and, and it took a few dollars to get this up and off the ground, but we didn't actually have a budget line item for it. That's how few dollars it took. And we educated 2,200 people. And this is a phenomenon that has been replicated now, it's been replicated in ways that generate hundreds or thousands of dollars of tuition, but in many other places, this is being done for free. Uh, public health campaigns, MOOCs, giving accurate information from authoritative sources in an accessible and, more importantly, affordable uh, form of access. The train there 
That's the train station I departed from when I came here to this conference. I live in a little town in eastern Ontario called Castleman. We don't have universities or courses or things like that. It's a small town. We're lucky we have a train, and they tell us we're lucky we have a train. How do you offer CPD to the now three doctors we have working in our community um, without having them leave the community? Uh, that flash sale, that's a Udemy course, same technology, sells for $14.95. So what's going on? Identifying learner needs. Um, Consider how we do it now as compared to how we could do it when learners are self-directed. Choosing their own learning objectives, defining their own learning outcomes. We have, and there were some discussions in some of the talks yesterday, uh, fairly involved mechanisms for identifying learner needs, identifying where the gaps are, etc. My guess, and it's a guess because I don't know this field. But my guess is that the best people to be able to identify the learning needs are the people who are experiencing them in the workplace. That would be my guess. So hypotheses you can test empirically if you want. If that's the case, then why go through a long involved process of flaking, forming, and distributing those learning needs in the form of learning outcomes and learning objectives and high-priced courseware, why not just enable a support mechanism that allows that person to address that learning need at the time and place where it occurs? That's the distributed network model. And what we've seen in actual surveys in the workplace, and I know there's no numbers on that, you have to go look at real research, but uh, roughly 80-20, 80, 80 self-directed personal learning in the workplace, 20% prescribed training. I'm getting pres prescribed training at NRC. One of their courses was on diversity, which I thought was pretty amusing. Not because I'm opposed to diversity, I embrace diversity, but I would also spend a lifetime studying it. But now I have to take this course because it was identified as a need. And yes, it's a need. Yeah. Measuring outcomes. Um, again, this is a whole talk, right? Uh, there's the different ways of measuring outcomes. At the bottom, that chain represents the four-level Kirkpatrick model of evaluating learning. Uh, the level one reaction did, was the person happy with the course? Did they give you high scores on the, on the smile sheet? Uh, level two, did they actually learn this stuff? Did they pass the test? Um, level three, do they actually implement that in their workplace? That might get a little bit harder to test for because it's not on the test because now they've left the learning place and they're in the workplace. Level four, did that change in behavior actually improve outcomes in the workplace? How are you going to measure all of that? Do you even measure that now? Well, you probably go through a double loop kind of process, a long involved kind of process, but what would be better, wouldn't it, would be a mechanism for tracking the actions, tracking the learning, and being able to associate those. So if you see a change in the learning, and you see a change in the outcomes, you can possibly draw a correlation. It's graph, it's messy, it's hard, uh, but you know, it's, at least it's not like giving people tests and hoping that that's a good measurement of outcomes. The, these models of learning where you watch a video and then take a multiple choice test uh, is, to me, that's a laughable form of assessment. Uh, again, one of our mandatory training courses you know, on security, which I really know nothing about, but I did set the record of 20 minutes, beginning to end, finishing the course. Uh, you have to click through those pages really fast. Don't watch the videos. Uh, when in doubt, pick C. 84%. <laughs> so here's the double loop. 
for improving patient outcomes. Ultimately, you want a learning system that integrates with your workplace activity system with your workplace outcome system. And the only way to do that is, in my mind, with a distributed network of the type I've been describing. You can try to do it centralized. You can try, but to me, that would be a nightmare. And as someone who works in the federal public service and is paid through the Phoenix pay system, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> And finally, resiliency. Who is going to be more reliable? A person who took a course and passed a test? Or a person who can manage their own training, manage their own learning, when and as needed? Where is your organizational resilience going to come from? Um, don't want to criticize it. I had a guy here connecting the internet, the only way he knows how to connect to the internet is close the browser, open the browser, the little window pops up, right? It's, it's a process, it's a procedure, it works, it's great, he gets it, he gets it right every time. Um, but it closes the browser, which slows me down because all of my windows were open in the browser. You see the difference between following the procedure and understanding the concepts behind the problem you're trying to solve and get it, getting the problem solved without creating side effects. That's something that you guys probably know a lot more than I do. Uh, but it applies in education as well. If you just simply prescribe an educational solution, you may be doing more damage than uh, you're solving. Uh, which takes us to, to wrap up in the approximately one minute and 30 seconds I have left. A few words on evidence. First of all, I want you to ask yourself, is learning like medicine really? Uh, this is not so much addressing the presentations I heard here, although maybe a little bit, but certainly in the learning and development community, you be beginning to hear people talking about online learning as an intervention um, in uh, online learning we have something called the Campbell collaboration which is like the Cochrane collaboration um, should we think of teaching as treatment is a person who needs learning suffering from a gap or are they looking for an opportunity an affordance is psychology the same as physiology? Um, I read an article in The Guardian the other day suggesting that yes it is, it's all genetically defined. I don't agree with that article and I think a lot of people don't. Is there an educational Hippocratic Oath and would you take one? I, I think there should be, I'm tempted to call it the Downs Oath, but I think we'll stick with Hippocratic. Even more to the point, what counts as success? I mean, this is something that we haven't actually nailed down. And to my mind, success is going to be different for each person in the room. But that's never how we hear about learning when we read about it or attend sessions on it, etc. And what would count as evidence for that success, whatever it is? Again, is it passing the test? Is it doing, you know, is it signing the right form in the clinic? Consider the difference between remembering something, which is the current model, the content-based model, as compared to being able to do something, which is one step further, versus doing the right thing, even though it might not be what you were taught, versus knowing why it's the right thing, versus being able to determine for yourself what is right. How are you going to accomplish that kind of success? This is a slide on competencies because someone talked about them during one of the sessions yesterday. And it makes me ask, is assessment of the performance of something the same as assessment 
of the competencies that make up that task. I use this example a lot. I maybe shouldn't, because as I said, I know nothing about medicine. But what counts as being a good doctor? What counts as passing whatever it is that you have to pass from being an intern to actually being allowed to be a doctor? There's somebody who's judging you, who's evaluating you. Possibly a panel or whatever. I know, there's people, right? It's not dumb, I'm sure. And they're looking at you, Joe intern or Jill intern, and they're saying, how are they, and we want to ask, how are they assessing that person? Do they say, well, they can do kidneys, they can do hearts, they can do lungs, they can do blood tests, and on and on and on and on. Is that how that person is assessed? I submit, no. I submit that what is happening is that an experienced professional doctor or surgeon or whatever looks at an aspiring upcoming surgeon, doctor, whatever, and literally recognizes that they are qualified. And that's a complex phenomenon. It's the same way you recognize your grandmother when she's walking towards you in the train station, right? You don't check off it. Gray hair, blue eyes, five foot four, limp. Yeah, that's her. Oh. You just see it. That just seeing it, that recognition process is a network process. It's your neural network, as it were, snapping to attention. Ah, that's it. And then after the fact, because you've recognized, oh yeah, this is a successful doctor. Okay, here's why I said that. It's not really why, but here's why I said that. They can do hearts, they can do lungs, they can do livers. Competencies are the way we justify passing somebody after the fact, but it's not the evidence we used to pass that person. Think about that. Bias, great talk by Michael Allen yesterday. And the only thing I would add is, are we bringing the same biases to the evaluation of learning and continuing professional development methodology that we bring to medicine and other things? Looking deeper, um, my evidence is the 30,000 or so posts I've done over 17 years in this subject. You are free to investigate every single one of them in my commentary on those posts. Uh, each one of those 30,000 points to an individual resource authored by somebody in the community. You can also search on them, which is pretty handy. Um, and I have an e-learning course starting shortly, another MOOC, uh, because I'm stubborn that way. Um, and there's the address, and hopefully the back channel will be working better. And I really don't know why it's dying, because this is craziness. Um, like, these are Perl modules that aren't loading. Why? Um, and that's me, and that's my website, and thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes. Does anyone have any burning questions for Stephen before we head into the break? Yeah. <laughs> and and, and uh, the idea that that maybe the internet doesn't always uh, lead to diversity is, is something that I sort of grapple with. And just to throw out a sort of medically related example, I'd like your your ideas on something like the fact that uh, communities do tend to form. And an example might be a bit relevant here with medical education would be the anti-vaxxer community. Mm. So that, that's, that's an excellent example, and it's not an easy problem. And it's, it's, of course, an instance of what we call the fake news problem. It's vaxxers, it's not news, but you know, it may as well be. I've characterized those kinds of problems as consensus problems. 
Um, the problem isn't that individual people are anti-vaxxers. You know, ideally, you'd like it to be the case that everybody loves vaccines. But if you don't have some skeptics in the room about vaccinations, then you don't have the necessary correction that you need in case it turns out that vaccinations really were bad. I don't think they are. I think they're actually pretty good. But, you know, things go wrong. Um, so the, the problem comes when it appears to be the case that the proposition that the anti-vaxxer case has equal weight with the vaxxer case. And that's the consensus problem. Right now, the way the internet is structured, it's structured for what can be called cascading failures of this sort. In other words, it's kind of a network, but it's a very centralized network. And if you get at one of the centralized nodes, or if you become one of the centralized nodes, think Alex Jones, then you can create cascading errors through the network without appropriate checks and balances. So someone's an anti-vaxxer, plus she thinks Hillary is a crook, so Alex Jones picks up on that, anti-vaxxer, Hillary is a crook, checks all the buttons, passes that on, and then that's distributed to 20 million people, and then it's an inevitable network effect that they're going to appear the same. So the response to that, to my mind, is to construct your network so that it's resistant to these cascades. And that means generally, and I'm you know, generalizing a lot here, a more distributed, less centralized source. Now you still have anti-vaxxers, you still have the propagation of anti-vaxxer ideas, but now you have more resistance to those anti-vaxxer ideas. It's very similar in the fact that the, the mathematics is the same as epidemiology, right? And if you have a typhoid Mary, you can spread typhoid Mary, typhoid everywhere. But if you have a distributed community where you can limit the interactions of a typhoid Mary to a small group, then each of these members in the small group have multiple other influences that can counteract that spread of that idea. Okay, badly phrased, but I hope you got the idea there. Does that make sense to you? I should say, I shouldn't say, does that make sense to you? Because that's kind of insulting. I should say, do you agree with that? And then you're still free to say no, and then I'll continue to knock. But I, yeah, I'm trying to stop saying, does that make sense to you? I'm sorry. I love list servers. I wish there were more of them. They've, they've kind of died out and everybody's moved to Facebook and Twitter, but I really do like them. Sure, and one of the things, relative to your system, we have a closed system. So we're not broadcasting everywhere. Um, and so that's one of our limits to respect yeah. your model. But we have to deal with privacy issues. Uh, so. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, and, Again, I talk a lot in dichotomies, but there are many gray areas. There are many areas where you allow for this, you, you alter that, because circumstances are different. Uh, the last thing I would ever say is that any general principle is correct. Especially in online social environments, setting 
can erode people's compassion. I, I recently heard a uh, talk from Brian Hodges uh, where he was talking about what's missing in healthcare sometimes, that we're moving away from compassion, we're moving towards an efficiency model. Mm. How do you structure a moose that it doesn't erode people's compassion? Is it possible? Is it possible, and as proven by looking at a variety of people's Twitters, that compassion can be lacking, social skill can be wanted? How do we structure a move for CPD education structures and move so as not to erode these crucial skills? That's a great question. <clears throat> Certainly, yeah, 140 and now 280 character tweets do not engender compassion. I think we've learned that. Also, you know, just the, the, the non, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to say directed, that's not quite right. But the, the non-specific interaction between strangers or the, the non-focused interaction between strangers also does not foster compassion. Um, to me, it's always been about understanding that there's a human at the other end of the line, right? Uh, Terry Anderson, Randy Garrison, and Walter Archer would talk about presence, social presence, cognitive presence, teaching presence. And it's a good theory and it's worth following up, but I find the word presence to be a bit of a black box. Um, what you're looking for is evidence of and then ultimately empathy for the fact that there is a life happening there that they have thoughts ideas dreams goals fears pains etc to allow you to empathize so the more comprehensive the sharing the more likely that is to do the less structured the less artificial and the fewer robots in your course the more likely you are and this is a hypothesis, this isn't fact, right? You, you have to measure this, but this is what I believe is true, and I think the evidence shows, right? Would foster that, that feeling of empathy. And let me, let me tell you why I think that. Um, for me, I, I was around when the internet was, you know, the web was just created. It was so cool. Um, but what you could do back then is go from home page to home page to home page to home page because that's what the web was right it was all personal home pages there was well, yahoo was some guy's idea there was no google and it was an amazing thing going from home page to home page and you would see these people like every home page was different and they were awful um, but but they were real and that's what allowed me to connect out with people uh, i took part in um what, in online games called muds multi-user dungeons we used those in the early days for teaching purposes as well but they fostered long synchronous interactions between people and so we got to know the people at the other end. Don't know what they look like or where they live or anything like that or even their name. Uh, you know, it was Fred the Troll. You know, but Fred the Troll was a real person because of all the various interactions. So it's with the richness of the communication that allows us to understand that there's a person at the other end of the line. And I think that probably what we want to do in MOOCs. And it's certainly one of the reasons why in, in our MOOCs, unlike Udemy, Udacity, etc., in our MOOCs, we want people to create things, whatever, and share these things directly with each other so that they can see the other people having the same problems you're having, struggling with the same things you're struggling, or different problems or whatever, as the case may be. Thanks. <clears throat> and what else? Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> it's working. <laughs> thank you, and uh, out of respect for formal protocol, I really, I know we've just given you a round of applause, but we really appreciate such a different way of thinking about things, especially from an outside perspective today. So thank you so much. Please join me again in thanking Stephen. <laughs>
um, break started and now it's over. No, I'm kidding. We've got about a couple of minutes out of respect for the next presenters who've gone to a lot of trouble um, on their workshops that are happening at 9.30. Please take your coffee or beverage to go and we'll try and start as close to 9.30.